So a few weeks ago, I released a video in which I talk about Astro's Playroom, a pre-installed launch shot off from the PS5, which takes what is supposed to be a tech demo and transforms it into a really fun platformer. I'll leave a link to that video if you want to check it out. But during the production of that video, I did some research and figured out that Astro's Playroom was a sequel to another game that was a sequel to a mini game within a game that was a sequel to another game. Holy fuck, my brain hurts after reading that. So yeah, the whole cycle I listed all began with the Playroom VR, the sequel to the Playroom, which was a tech demo built into the PS4 that pretty much lets you fuck around with the PlayStation camera. Also, the Playroom VR is actually available for free on the PS5 store, so I guess I could finally play it now. Anyways, the player in VR featured many mini games to play, most of them being pretty short, but one stuck out among the rest called Robot Rescue. It was like a 3D platformer in VR that actually made quite good use of the VR headset as well as the controller, but unfortunately it only lasted about 10 minutes. This mini game left a lot of people wanting a full blown game based off this since it had a lot of potential. The one day in October of 2018, Sony was like, Hey guys, w what if we like, um, uh, we, uh, uh, Astrobot Rescue Mission was a PSVR exclusive title made by Japan Studios and was released on October 2nd, 2018. Upon release, the game was praised by critics for its creative level design and brilliant use of the VR headset. It was even awarded Best VR Game of 2018, and it was up against games like Tetris Effect and Beat Saber, so that's quite the achievement, actually. You know, I'm surprised how this game kind of just flew off of the radar if it was universally praised, probably because of the overwhelming popularity of Fortnite, but even then around the time of its release, it was starting to die out. Maybe it's because of the game being exclusive to VR, since virtual reality isn't for everyone. Unlike just staring at a TV, some people may experience experience motion sickness, have seizures, or just get massive headaches from this thing. Fortunately for me, I'm not one of these people. So yeah, after the Asher review, I was curious, and since I enjoyed that game so much, I went ahead and bought Rescue Mission. And after playing through the game completely, I gotta say, this game deserves all of the praise it's gotten. So enough with the stupid interest about information no one cares about, let's actually start talking about Astrobot Rescue Mission, or, well, sorry, I mean Astrobot Red Knees Mission. Yeah, for some reason, my copy is all in Danish, which is interesting to say the least. The game menus and stuff are still in English, so that's good. Also, for this video, I'll be using my PS4 capture footage, and it takes Sony like a week to ship the PS5 camera adapter, so sorry if the quality of the footage is lower than usual. So, uh, future Brent here, during the production of the video, the camera adapter did actually arrive, so some of the footage used, probably mostly just the end game stuff, will be at a higher quality in 60 FPS, so enjoy. Alright, so, after about Rescue Mission, am I right? Let's just boot up the game and... I think I just came. Seriously, I was in shock when I heard this shit. I know the start of review is a weird time to talk about this, but oh my god, this game's soundtrack. Kenneth C. M. Young, please become my dad. I only try and mention the soundtrack in these reviews if I just really like it, but I just can't neglect this masterpiece. All the songs here just have so much variety, and in general, it is really damn good. Here's your normal and upbeat songs, mostly for overworld levels, the calm and slightly ominous songs for underground levels, and those loud ass intense guitar tracks for the bosses. My favorite track in the entire list is probably just the main theme. It does a really good job capturing the energy this game has, if that makes any sense. I've heard some criticisms that the game's soundtrack gets repetitive at times, but honestly, I really didn't mind it just because of how much I enjoyed the soundtrack. Also, after playing this game, I realized quite a few tracks are ripped from Rescue Mission or put in Astro's Playroom, and now I feel bad for praising that game instead of this game because most of my favorite songs are originally made for Rescue Mission. Also, can I say something? I love Astro's design, honestly. Wait. In my opinion, I believe Astro is the perfect fit for a PlayStation mascot, but I mean, he didn't have much competition. The fuck is a Polygon man? He just looks like a low-poly version of Rick. I love the family-friendly vibes you get off this little guy, and he's pretty cute. Honestly, I'll be perfectly fine if it was PlayStation's mascot starting with this game. So believe it or not, this is a game we're talking about, so we'll be discussing that right about now. Astro by Rescue Commission has you play as this little AR bot from the playroom who I guess is special because he has a funny cape. Well, he's the captain of a ship that looks almost identical to Asobi from the playroom, and one day while Astro and his crew were flying around space, I'm stupid. Stupid ass, ugly ass, Toy Story alien having ass, looking like a fucking booger drenched in cum having ass, Fall Guy looking ass, some of a goddamn stupid motherfucking bitch, comes in and rapes Astro's ship and scatters all seven of his crewmates all around the world, and once he collects all seven of them, he can summon the mighty- yeah, this motherfucker destroys his ship for no reason other than to be an asshole, and it's up to Astro to collect the five parts of his ship, rescue all 212 crewmates, and get his revenge on the TOY STORY ALIEN LOOKING AT- Upon entering the very first level, you already know you're in for a treat, visually and physically. We'll start things off by talking about the aesthetics in these levels. You know, something about this game I really like is how diverse all the level themes are. Like here, you see all these levels from Super Mario World? It's pretty obvious they're all from the same world since they all follow the same theme. Look at all four levels from the first world of this game. What the fuck? Remember, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, I actually really like what they did, straying away from the typical stereotypes. Well, yeah, there are a few cliche ones you'd expect to find on the platformer, but you really can't have a platformer without an underground Minecraft section and all that. But some of the level themes are ones you'd never really expect to find on a 3D platformer. Like we have a construction site, or whatever this is, a sky garden, a sky amusement park, and a Japanese dojo. Yeah, that Japanese level, or to be specific, 5-3, is honestly my favorite level in the entire game, and not only for the visuals. The levels aren't as tech-related as an Astro's Playroom, and I will admit, I like that style better, but I mean, really this 
game doesn't even have to follow that style at all, since this is like a mission across the entire globe, but Astro's playroom setting was just inside of the PS5 itself. Also, I just want to say that there's a level called Undertales, and in this level you fall down a huge ass hole and land in flowers. What the fuck, Japan Studios? Seriously, I'm surprised they managed to make almost every single level stand out from each other, visually speaking. You really don't see that a lot on platforms, and I'm glad this game did that. Now, there are actually a few occasions where a level theme is reused, like how there are two volcanic theme levels, but whenever this does occur, they make sure the other one sticks out with different gimmicks and all that. Which brings me to my next topic, the actual gameplay. You know, the shit you buy the game for. I wouldn't call this game's moveset bare bones, just simple. It's mostly seen from Robot Rescue, a jump plus a hover jump and a punch. No funky moves like a ground pound or wall jump, just those three. But to be fair, you could tell they were going for a really simple control scheme since this is looking to be PlayStation's newest mascot platformer, and making the game accessible for newbies means more people get to experience this stuff. Okay, well that's not entirely true. You actually do have a spin attack, but like, if we're being completely honest, I barely use this thing. First of all, you have to hold on square for about three seconds, which isn't so bad, but the normal attack is just a simple press of the square button, there's no reason for you to wait and charge it to attack them rather than just approach the enemy and slap them. Since they don't have any health bars, it can be dealt with in one hit. Well, except for this fellow. And there's only one enemy in the entire game that actually requires a spin to be killed, so it's just like this game forgot about it or something. And to be real with you guys, I think I use a spin to terrorize the boss on the astral ship more than I use it in levels to defeat enemies. Now let's talk about the actual level design. If it wasn't the location that made a level memorable, then it was probably the level design itself. The level design isn't as unique as all the aesthetics in the levels are, but that is pretty hard to achieve. I'm just gonna address the blatantly obvious right now. This game is really easy. The level design is simple and easy to play, and at the same time, it's really fun. And there aren't any puzzles that you have to stop and think, what am I supposed to do? It's just do it, and also have fun. There are also quite a lot of enemies sprinkled throughout the levels, which really don't bring any challenge. Like I mentioned earlier, they aren't rocking health bars, so just one punch or hover jump will get the job done. Anyways, almost every single level is memorable, for sometimes the level design, the backgrounds, or just both. Most of the levels are centered around one specific gimmick, mostly all the gadgets you can use, more on those later. Sometimes either just giving you more of the same to do with it, or inventing new challenges and expanding upon on those. But yeah, some levels can be a little schizophrenic and will make you use a power up for about 20 seconds and then the level just ends. Now, the real reason they kept Astro's moveset so simplified was so they could focus on the capabilities of the VR. And some of you may recall, during my Astro's player review, I said that you were just a camera from the looks of this thing, and boy was I wrong. I'm honestly surprised how well the VR was implemented into this game, and I can't picture it without it, honestly. You're not just an invisible camera following Astro, you're experiencing the adventure with him. You can see your own shadow, you have your own model, you are an object in this world, just like Astro himself. You'll jerk your head to smash right through these walls, these cannonballs will fuck up your screen, Astro gets stuck to your face underwater, you'll dodge projectiles from these slime enemies that otherwise cover up your screen, you can play ball with these enemies, and the bird boss even shits on you. Top tier gameplay right here, folks. Heck, even if you look at him, he'll make eye contact with you and even wave at you. Now, you're not completely free as a camera, you're usually in a fixed position that only ever really views an Astro moves for, but since this is a VR game, you can still look around your surroundings. And this game really does encourage you to do that, some camera angles are forced to lean in to see Astro or look up or look to your left, which I never had any issues with since the PSVR rarely has detection issues with the headset itself. Also, something I found odd is that once the camera moves forward in a level, it can't ever go back on itself, so if you just barely miss that one collectible, then tough luck, you're gonna have to restart the level. Well, sometimes you can just turn around and navigate your way through, but it would be a lot more convenient if we could just properly backtrack in this game, honestly. But there are some camera angles that are a bit disorienting, to say the least, to the point where it can be really hard to tell which direction is north and which one is south. In these cases, the lasers that come out of your hover jump will be your guiding light, and if you happen to fall, you can save yourself with a slap if you're fast enough. So the main reason they simplified the Astro's movement to be as simple as you can get was not only for accessibility, but a focus on these gadgets you can equip to your controller. Yeah, this is what the majority of the levels consist of. Platforming challenges that consist of funky power-ups, which I found that made level design quite interesting, actually. They're way better than the vehicles in Astro's player because that isn't a VR game, so quit trying to force in motion controls, please. Anyways, there are about five of them. Each one will require use of the touchpad in some way or another. Like, for example, my personal favorite gadget, the grappling hook, makes you swipe up on the touchpad to shoot it and back down to release it. You'll mostly just be using this thing to hook onto surfaces to either create a rope for Astro to cross or to open up a platform to use. A close second for me was the Shuriken slash Ninja Star power up. It's pretty self explanatory, you just swipe on the touchpad to shoot out a Ninja Star. In the earlier levels, this thing was primarily used to shoot webs and shit, but towards the latter parts of the game, you'll be shooting these on moving surfaces to create platforms for Astro to use, and this can make level design very interesting. Fortunately, pretty much all of these gadgets will be used in more than one level, including boss fights, so if you really 
really like one of them and want to see more, then you're in luck. Well, there is one sole exception, and that's the flashlight. It's only using 5-2 because really it's the only level that can actually work with it. It's just as it seems, your controller becomes a flashlight, so you use it to aim and see the level, as well as being able to, like, shock enemies or something by clicking the touchpad. Yeah, I don't know what to call this. It doesn't seem very interesting at first, but you'll be using the flashlight to reveal invisible platforms later on, and this spices up things by a lot. All these gadgets are what give each and every level its identity, because they're all just so well implemented. And I didn't even mention the water gun, which is mostly used to activate platforms, but is later used to fill up spaces with water and even create obsidian on lava. Nor did I mention the minigun accessory, which basically lets you live out your American fantasies and shoot the hell out of everything in sight. And the rumble makes it a lot more satisfying. Also, without any gadgets, your DualShock 4 is still as lethal as it would be with them equipped. Since your controller is technically a physics object in-game, you can actually kill enemies with the controller if you're close enough. Seriously, I think I had a little too much fun just slapping Astro with my controller. No hard feelings, right? Also, Sony. Please make a DualShock 4 with the design used in this game. It looks super cool in-game, and I'm sure lots of other people other than me would also buy it. All of the gadgets are used in this game's many boss fights in some way, shape, or form. There are a total of six boss fights, one at the end of each world with a special final boss. Each of these encounters brings something unique to the table, whether it be the gadget required to beat them, their attack pattern, or just the background used in these levels. But they do all follow the same formula. The boss will launch a few attacks at you, usually in no particular order, they get tired, then you use whatever gadget you may be using to kick their ass or pee three times until they die. This does make all the bosses sound repetitive, but they really aren't, since the core of the bosses here being their attack patterns are all unique and never feel shamelessly cloned from another. By far my favorite is a bird boss, and from the pure aesthetics, it's already my favorite one. You're high up above these clouds on these tall rocks, and to get from one platform to another, you have to do this parkour on these leaves, which really make you feel nervous like the enemy is just this huge overwhelming force, and that's because it is. Something else these bosses are really good at is making you feel so damn tiny compared to everything else. I mean, look at how big the shark is compared to Astro. In the normal levels, you feel bigger than everything, but once you get to the boss fight, you'll be like... Heck, Astro's even tiny enough to fit inside your controller. Also, I don't know about any of you guys, but I really wasn't a big fan of the octopus boss fight. Pretty much the entire fight is just extinguishing all the flames and squirting water on these douchebags. I mean, it's still easy, I didn't find it challenging, but just too repetitive for my liking. Really, none of the bosses were really that challenging to beat, but they were still fun. These bosses were definitely one of my highlights of this game, which isn't something I feel often when talking about platformers. Now, legends say if you observe the box art with your eyes, the game actually is called Astrobot Rescue Mission. So you're probably wondering, where is the rescuing? Yes, rescuing your crew is still a part of this game. In fact, in the main collectible, actually. In each level, there are 8 bots to collect, but honestly, they're all really easy to spot. Even with the incentive to find every bot in a level, you usually find more than half of them on your first playthrough. Now, there are some of them where you actually gotta fucking try like, bitch, did you really expect you to look up in the sky? Most of the time, when you're close to one of the bots, you can hear them crying for help, so that already makes things a lot easier. You actually need a certain amount of bots to access the boss at the end of each world, but these were honestly a joke. I always had way more than plenty to get to the boss, sometimes even double. But these bots aren't the only thing to collect throughout the game. In each level, you can actually find a hidden chameleon that usually isn't too hard to find. Most of the time, you'll need to look all around you to find it, and like the lost robots, the scanners are reveal their location with sound. Most of the time, you'll think, wow, it would be pretty funny if there's a chameleon right here. Wow, it was pretty funny that I found a chameleon right here. Now, you're probably wondering, what the hell do these things even do? Well, I'll find a chameleon in a level, unlocks that level's level in the challenge belt. The challenge belt is basically a short series of little challenges that go along with each main level. They're all really short, a minute at most assuming you're trying to speedrun them. Each level in the challenge belt is focused around one specific gimmick, most of the time a gimmick used in its respective level. For example, 1-4 is the first level that uses the hookshot power-up and this is what its level in the challenge belt looks like. They're a lot harder than the main levels, mostly because your incentive is usually to beat them as fast as possible, but they're still fun. Well, you know, except challenge 7, the one can fuck right off. The majority of them are all speedrun courses where you have to get to the goal as fast as possible and at the end you're rewarded with either 1 or 2 boss by some of your time. So yeah, to fully 100% this game, you're gonna have to find all 160 boss in the main levels, as well as each chameleon, then get a golden score on all 26 levels in the challenge belt. Well, actually, some of the levels in the challenge bar aren't even speedrun levels, they're score attack levels where you have to get the highest score in a limited amount of time. Most of them are just kill as many enemies as you can, and to be honest, I find myself liking some of these more than some of the speedrun levels. One of my favorite ones is challenge 14. This is one of the score attack levels. Basically, what you gotta do is you gotta bounce on these leaves to gain height, and then jump through the rings that give you 50 coins each. It may be really simple, but not only is the environment really pleasing to look at in this level, but the bouncing is super fun. But by far my favorite challenge is number 7. Before I talk about the level itself, let me ask you a little question. For all of you who have played Astrobot Rescue Mission, how many of you all really like this challenge? If you did, then just raise your hand. Yeah, well if you raise your hand, you deserve to be fucking executed in the name of Allah because this is the worst fucking level in the entire game! You know what's bad when I dedicate an entire paragraph to shitting on it. It's not a speedrun level, nor is it a score attack level. What you have to do is you have to get to the goal without losing a single life. Now, it may not seem that bad until you see the level itself. Japan Studios? What the fuck is this?
Which employee designed this course? Because I like to let them know they have a $40,000 bounty on their head. Seriously, what even is this shit? I just went through this course without taking damage and oh god, it's just so fucking boring. Obviously, you don't want to get hit, so you take time with the fast-paced music playing and really makes you want to. And if you die to the end, you spend like a full minute just getting back to where you were. And on top of that, it's a water level and water physics suck and ah! God, I must spend like 20 minutes on this level just because how damn long it takes on each and every attempt to get back on where you died. And water levels suck in almost every game, but the only exception being Hydro City from Sonic 3. The stage really did load up the anger in me. It almost went crazy. No! Did I mention this footage was recorded at 2.30 a.m.? But there is one last kind of level in the challenge world that I haven't covered yet, and that's the boss ring matches. Yeah, instead of finding a chameleon in a boss level, you just automatically unlock its respective level in the challenge belt, which are basically just the exact same boss, but to get gold, you have to beat it without taking any damage. Yeah, some of these aren't so bad, but there are some bosses that I really wasn't looking forward to replaying, like the shark boss. Seriously, what the fuck even is this attacker, and how do I not take damage here? Honestly, I just thought I could have come up with something more original than just replay the exact same boss, but this time do it perfectly. Like, maybe just a new speedrun slash score attack level with the same aesthetics as the boss, or maybe an entirely new attack pattern with the same boss, or maybe mix up a platforming challenge and a boss fight, similar to the final boss in New Super Mario Bros. Wii. Okay, now I collected all 212 robots, where the hell is my platinum trophy? Well, there is one last thing you need to do to truly 100% this game. Remember all the coins scattered throughout the levels? Yeah, well, you actually have to spend your coins to play this crane game in the Astro Ship to win these toys or whatever, which after you unlock a full set, comes together to make one big toy set you can mess around with in the Astro Ship. I mean, I guess the addition is pretty neat, but like, why do these take so long? Seriously, this game like one singular toy takes around like 30 seconds and that's mostly why I hate this feature. I really don't want to make this comparison but at least in Fortnite when you're opening up a loot llama you can speed it up so you don't want to wait as long as you normally would. Despite always having a shit ton of coins, I really wanted to go actually use them because of how boring this thing was. And seriously, you will get a shit ton of coins in this game. I found myself finishing each level with about 200 to 300 on average. But what I do like is how you can see each and every bot you've collected in the Astro ship. And my favorite thing to do on the ship is mass genocide. I love that! Alright, after doing all that shit, I have officially 100% an Astrobot Rescue Mission and now get out and see the real world. Well, okay, fuck you too, Japan Studios. That's what I mean by social life. I was trying to play the game you created, you fucking bitches. You know, fuck this review. Fuck this game. This game is shit. I hate this game, actually. Zero out of ten. Fuck you. Okay, in conclusion, Astro Bot Rescue Mission is a really special game in my opinion. It has fun and creative level design, a killer soundtrack, and makes great use of the VR headset. For anyone with the PSVR, this is a game you have to play. And I really hope this isn't the last of Astro. He has a lot of potential as Sony's next mascot, and I think they're starting to realize that with the release of Astro's Playroom for PS5. Hopefully in the next Astro game, it isn't VR exclusive. Not because I dislike the VR headset or anything like that, but I just want it to be more accessible. But for a sequel to Astro's Playroom, I really hope they don't shove motion controls on Astro like they did in that game. I'm not saying this should give Astro a complete move set rather just try and implement new gadgets to use that don't require either motion controls or VR. Anyways, I'll be signing off now. Have a good day everyone and I'll see you guys in the next video.